During the eight high water months, the inhabitants of Tonle Sap barely see dry land. The village's canals become clogged with the fishermen's boats, and fishing is once again the main activity. All of local life takes place on the water. They go to school by boat, move merchandise around by boat. There are even boats with ingenious hanging gardens for growing vegetables. The majority of those who fish Tonle Sap live on the water. Some opt for a fixed home with a house raised on stilts, which remains dry all year round. But in Prek Tol, most of the families have gone for the originally Vietnamese option of a floating habitat, made of boats with rafts moored between them. Just like the people who live in them, these boathouses adapt to every little change that occurs on Ton Le Sap. They follow its movements, traveling up and down in accordance with the lake's own rhythm. Kuyan has always lived in just such a house. Like many other Tonle Sap fishermen, he raises Siamese crocodiles in floating cages. Previously present in great numbers in the lake, these creatures are now rare in the wild. In a few months, once these have grown big enough, the best specimens will be sold in Vietnam or Thailand, where their skin will be used to make bags and shoes. Kuyan's favorite lodgers are not his crocodiles, however, but farmed fish of a quite unusual size. He wouldn't part with these for any price. They're panga, giant catfish, which can weigh as much as 50 to 70 kilos. These are about five years old. All around here, in fact, all around the lake, I'm the only person to have any. I'm very proud of them and take good care of them. Once they're big enough, these fish can fetch a good price. But I'm growing them for their symbolic power. I want to save them for the younger generation. Tonle Sap is very important to everyone in Cambodia. It feeds the people. Its fish provide us with protein, and we can cook all sorts of different dishes with them. We sell our fish in the neighboring countries as well as in Cambodia itself. The entire population of the country depends on the lake. The water goes on rising until October. By the time it reaches the highest level, only the flooded forest treetops can still be seen. The fish then disperse throughout the now immense lake, and the nomad fisher families have no other choice but to accompany their migration. We have to find a spot where the water isn't so deep and where there are more fish. Yes. There are too few fish here now. We have to move. We'll get ready to move as quickly as we can. In search of a more promising fishing spot, Phuc Si's family prepare to weigh anchor, taking with them everything they own. The fisherman and his son lash together the house, the fish tanks, and the precious floating garden. Towed by a tiny powered canoe, the impressive convoy gets underway. It's the right time to be moving because the storms will soon come and getting around the lake will become a dangerous undertaking. The fishing families move their homes in this way up to 12 times a year, going wherever the migrating fish lead them. 
This peripatetic existence is the price these families pay in order to live in constant harmony with the resources of the lake. At the end of October, when the water level is at its highest, the lake is covered with water hyacinths. This invasive plant, originally from Amazonia, chokes Tonle Sap. It makes boating and fishing difficult and uses up a lot of the lake's precious oxygen. The women of Prechtol form small teams which do their best to free the lake from the plant's stranglehold. They side the hyacinths by the armful. Their roots are used as compost, the flowers are eaten, and the stems are plated to make hammocks. This way, the women of Prechtol have turned this yearly scourge into a useful resource. When the water hyacinths are proliferating and the snakes are swimming at the surface, the water has reached its peak. For Ku Yan, it's time to start a new type of fishing. This one's been dead a while. The hyacinth groves are the preferred habitat of the water snakes and the small fish on which they feed. These reptiles, most of which are not poisonous, have no chance of escaping the nets placed by Ku Yan during the night. In only a few hours, he manages to catch dozens, and he prefers them still alive. Throw it in the tank. That one's still alive. The thousands of snakes caught daily in the Tonle Sap are not destined for the fishermen's dining tables, but for feeding their precious crocodiles. During this season, snake replaces fish on the crocodile's menu. Every year, Tonle Sap's farmed crocodiles consume millions of these snakes. It's the most extensive concerted snake hunt anywhere in the world. In November, the water level starts to drop. The phenomenon which began five months ago now reverses, and the flow of the water changes for the second time. Nature and people must once again adapt to the changes forced on them by the lake. The Mekong's flow is considerably diminished, and the Tonle Sap River can finally resume its role as an outlet. The water flows once again from the lake to the river, and Tonle Sap begins to empty out. The beating heart of Cambodia contracts as its vital precious liquid pours away. It's the beginning of a new period in the life of the lake, the low water season. The lake doesn't disappear entirely, but in a few months its surface area shrinks from 15,000 square kilometers to only 3,000. <laughs> 